Hi, I'm Will Sampson. Uh, I'm doing a talk on DIY firearms. This is an overview talk, uh, basically just covering all of the issues related to making your own firearms and uh, some of the laws and regulations, as well as some of the tools and things that you need to know if you're wanting to do that. And uh, I think it goes well with the uh, self-reliance uh, philosophy of most of the liberty community. Uh, this is uh, DIY firearms, uh, an overview. This is a broad brush thing. Um, the first thing that uh, I need to, to say is who I am not. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a gunsmith. I publish uh, uh, reproductions of historic firearms drawings, and I'm an amateur hobby gunsmith and have some you know, metalworking and woodworking background, also a woodworking editor. And I also was a newspaper journalist for about 20 years, so I have a little bit of affinity for government and how it works. Um, so all of that I'm gonna try and get out here, and there probably are people here that know more than me on individual parts of the subject, but uh, we're gonna try and get through and give you a good broad cross-section of legal issues, and just the scope of what's out there in DIY firearms and what you can do and what kind of tools you might need if you want to get into it and some resources for uh, uh, finding what you need. Um, so what kind of guns are we talking about? Um, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about muzzle loaders, single shot rifles and pistols, revolvers, bolt action rifles and pistols, semi-auto rifles and pistols, and restored and reproduction military arms. What I'm not gonna be talking about is zip guns and machine guns and full auto conversions and those kinds of things because they're really problematic as far as regulations and laws. Some of them may be lots of fun to play with, but uh, that's not what we're going to talk about today. Um, I wish I could show you this gorgeous picture up here. If somebody comes by my, my uh, campsite afterwards, I can show it to you. Um, this was, you were going to see a picture of a, an immaculate flintlock pistol that was built from plan, by one of my customers from plans. And he built it completely from scratch. And that's one avenue of DIY firearms, is building completely from scratch, starting with raw metal, raw wood, whatever it is, and, and building it. That's not the only alternative. Um, another gorgeous picture uh, that you're missing is an 1874 Sharp single shot rifle. Uh, again, that was built, in this case, it was built by a machinist who had access to very sophisticated equipment. He had uh, access to an EDM machine, which is an electro-discharge machining, and was able to reproduce the receiver of the gun completely with that method uh, and not have to have a casting. At my uh, uh, campsite, I have a 1874 Sharps casting that you can take a look at and see what a raw casting looks like that might... Uh, be turned into a gun. This picture, you can't see the picture, but you can see the gun. This is a uh, Ruger Mark II, but this was uh, made by me uh, as far as the receiver. All the other parts were from a parts kit. And I have blueprints for the receiver, which is a, a simple tube, um, and all that needs to be done is this part needs to be threaded for the barrel. and. Uh, Various parts need to be cut out. I use a vertical mill, but somebody could just use files and saws and do it by hand. A more sophisticated project. It's a 1911 pistol that was made from an 80% frame, much like this, an unfinished frame that had various machining to be done with it. And it's fully functional, works just the same as 1911 that you buy from, uh, you know, the gun shop. Uh, 
Um, I've also done Ruger 1022 rifle, where you can machine the, the receiver out of a block of alumina and have blueprints for doing that. So that's another option that you can do. So you do a semi-auto rifle like that. And of course, the, the semi-auto rifle that probably most people here are interested in is the AR-15. This is an 80% receiver, and I'll talk about, some of you may not know what that is, and I'll talk about what an 80% receiver is in a minute, but this is an unfinished casting of the lower receiver of an AR-15, and using uh, jigs and drills or machine tools, there's all sorts of different methods, you can finish this out and make it into a working rifle. A little bit of short history about DIY firearms. You know, obviously, going back to caveman days, somebody picked up a rock or a bone for better self-defense, and that's probably the first beginning of, of making some kind of a weapon for yourself. Um, I also do uh, archery and do make my own bows and arrows, and so you know, that's really the foundation of what we're talking about. It's just self-defense, providing, providing yourself a better weapon than you might normally have and using your skills to make that weapon. Um, so, you know, we went from club to bow to gun. Um, in America, the early uh, colonial gunsmiths played an incredibly important role in the war for independence and also people that uh, manufactured gunpowder. Uh, we could not have had a successful uh, war against the British without the skills of those people that were basically DIY gunsmiths. And then go into more sophisticated things. There's uh, one of the things I, I get in, interested in this topic because I'm really excited about the, the brilliance of certain inventors like John Moses Browning, Samuel Colt, Eli Whitney, uh, and William Ruger, uh, who had amazing views of what could be done with firearms, and a lot of them did it with pretty unsophisticated machinery and equipment. Um, and so there really isn't anything to stop you from doing something like that to make the same kinds of guns that those guys made. Um, and then today, we've got the ultimate high tech. Almost everything I've talked about so far is what is called a subtractive process. You take a hunk of metal or a casting and you take excess material away until you get the part that you want for your firearm. But today we now have additive processes to move into that and that's like 3D printing. Um, some of you are probably familiar with Cody Wilson and his plastic 3D printed gun. Um, and I think he talked at the, uh, the Liberty Forum uh, recently. That's an example of an additive process. We're talking, starting with nothing and then adding material to get a gun. But the, the plastic 3D printed gun that you've heard about is basically a single use weapon. And I'm not particularly interested in that kind of a thing. I'm interested in something that's a reliable, repeatable, useful weapon. Well, another company in Texas uh, recently announced that they used sintered metal 3D printing, which is basically using powder and a laser and the same kind of 3D printing technology as far as the design to print a complete 1911, same kind of pistol that I just showed you, all with uh, sintered metal. And it functions fully and it looks just like a really nice custom 1911. Uh, and so, you know, that's like really expensive equipment. That's not the kind of equipment that you're going to buy for your home shop. You know, we're talking maybe $100,000 for all the equipment or more. But that's where the technology is going. So who knows what it's going to be next year. Okay, if you want to start getting into DIY guns, um, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can get into it. Probably the easiest, most surefire, successful method is to buy a kit. Um, and there are, if you're into black powder and muzzle loaders, there are a lot of commercially available kits that you can make uh, a 
very useful, very uh, good gun. Uh, companies like uh, Cabela's and Sportsman's Guide um, sell kits like that, Dixie Gunworks. There's a whole bunch of different companies that, that sell those and you can all often find them too at flea markets and stuff because somebody you know bought the kit or got it as a gift and never built it and so there it is. Um, I have a number of uh, muzzle loaders that I bought uh, that I built from kits like this and they work great, shoot great and it's fun building the kit and a lot of the work has been done for you as far as inletting wood barrel and that sort of thing, uh, wood stocks for the barrel and all that kind of thing so it makes it a little easier for you to get into it. Um, and the other extreme is a completely scratch-built gun. Um, I mentioned the flintlock that one of my customers made. Uh, that applies to all levels of sophistication. I mean, if that uh, uh, guy with the EDM machine making the sharps, he made every single part to the gun. Um, and some of the blueprints I have are just receiver blueprints, but others are for every part of the gun. So if you really wanted to get into a project and have uh, you know, the experience of doing it, it's possible. But for most people, what they're going to want to do is maybe make the receiver, which is the part of the gun that legally is the gun, according to our regulations in this country, then uh, buy the parts as parts kits or as, as uh, brand new parts from supply houses or something like that. Um, you have to decide what's your level of, of comfort. Because even, for example, even very professional gunsmiths that are making uh, you know, competition rifles, uh, very rarely do they make the barrels for the rifles and do all the rifling in the barrel. They usually buy those from somebody that's a specialty source that makes the barrels. So even the quote unquote professional custom gun makers are frequently buying out some of the parts that they might use. Another th area that may be of interest to folks um, is uh, what I call demilled guns um, in parts kits. There are a lot of these, particularly apply to military arms, and there are a lot of cases where a, uh, a gun has been demilled, demilitarized by some destructive means. Um, this is a casting for an M1 Grand. This is a finished grand receiver, but you notice it's a little smaller because it was cut off. And they, when they demilitarized this gun, uh, they cut this into parts. Now, there are people that find these demilled receivers and get all the parts and weld them back together and make a new gun. That's not something I, I have ever done or recommend. I might recommend it if you're, what you're wanting to make is a historic wall hanger. But I'm not real confident, uh, unless you're a really good welder, uh, that you're going to get a working, reliable, safe firearm out of that, uh, putting it back. Yes, sir? If you can, I say what it is and I'll... They demilitarized that for what purpose? Is the M1 Garand wasn't uh, right. He wants to know why they demilitarized it. Well, it could have been a situation where this was seized uh, uh, from somebody uh, who was caught in a crime or something like that, or it could have been turned in in one of the gun collection things that police departments sometimes have. Um, there's all manner of ways. There's a thing going on right now. Um, you know, we shipped thousands of N1 carbines to South Korea. Um, for the Korean conflict and, and times after. And South Korea doesn't need those anymore, and, but Obama has signed a thing that prohibits their re-importation into the country. So here's you know, guns we paid for as taxpayers that went over there um, that are historic and valuable and working firearms, um, and we're not allowed to, to have them. But uh, you know, that's the stuff that's, that's going on. Um, one of the, there's other issues with, if you do a demilled thing, there's a legal issue um, connected to how many parts are a foreign manufacturer and, and all sorts of things involved with that. We'll talk about that in just a minute too. Um, the 80% revolution. I want to talk about what is an 80% frame. Um, 
this is an 80% frame, which means that it is 80% machined or less, that it's not a completed working frame. So the uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms considers this basically no different than a hunk of metal or a paperweight because it has not been completed it, more than 80% is those, so therefore is not a firearm as it stands. Now you can complete it, and it is legal uh, if you're legally uh, able to own a gun, you can complete this and make it into a working firearm. But um, as it stands right now, this is just a paperweight. So there's a bunch of folks that started um, manufacturing frames like this, receivers like this, not to be made into guns by them, but as a product that can be sold in an unfinished form. It's kind of like, you know, the guys that sell unfinished furniture. They don't have to deal with any of the, the finishing, which is the hardest part of making nice furniture. And so um, these guys can get on their CNC machines and crank out uh, these castings uh, machined to 80% level and then sell them to hobbyists or people that think they might eventually do it um, or for whatever reasons. And this has gotten so mainstream now, you can buy these on Amazon. Um, you can buy these from, from Sportsman's Guide. In fact, I got an email today from Sportsman's Guide, uh, just a regular sale flyer email that said, you know, 80% frame like this was you know, on sale for a hundred bucks for, for non-club members and 88 bucks or something like that if you're a member of their club. So, you know, they're, they're available now all over the place. And, and Brunel's, if no one's familiar with Brunel's, it's a, a well-known, uh, been around for 75 years, supplier to the gunsmith community, and uh, they sell these now. And they, uh, almost anybody can buy these. Um, Oh, one part of my background that's important that I didn't mention because of all of the craziness here, I live in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. I live less than a half a mile from the school and I heard the shots that morning. Um, I can't buy this from Brunel's or Sportsman's Guide now. Um, well, actually, I think I can get it from Brunel's. They have a different interpretation of Connecticut's new law, but Sportsman Guide will not ship this to me in Connecticut because they consider it's part of a prohibited firearm in, in Connecticut. So your, your mileage may vary on <laughs> all this depending on where you are. Um, and these are not the only 80% frames out there. There aren't just AR-15s. There are um, AR-10s out there. Right now there's a, a gentleman who I think is connected to Caspian Arms, which is a custom pistol manufacturer, uh, and he's been uh, selling uh, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, receivers uh, that are um, related to Caspian and products that they've made that are unfinished 80% receivers. Uh, there used to be a bunch of 1911s out there. They're getting harder to find, but you still see them on places like Gun Broker and that sort of thing uh, if you look for them. Um, it's all, you know, it, it catches catch can. I think a lot of the 1911 80% frames were casting rejects by various folks. There were a bunch of Ruger 1911 castings that were available for a while um, because uh, uh, they didn't, you know, there's like the, you know, buying a, a blemished product uh, and it didn't affect anybody that was going to be machining it anyway, but it didn't meet their standards. So what needs to be done on one of these 80% receivers? It all depends. In the uh, AR, typical things on the 80% receiver that need to be done is you need to clear out this area for the fire control parts, and there's holes that need to be done in there. And there's a jigs that you can get that will help you do that, and I'll show you the jigs in just a minute. Um, but it varies because some things that are sold as 80% frames aren't really 
80%. They aren't the same stuff. You can get somebody selling you an 80% uh, AR receiver and it will not have the uh, buffer threads in here. And that's a little more difficult for the average person to thread that than uh, uh, some of the other things. Um, or it may not have the magwell cut out, uh, which again is, is more difficult because there's a lot of metal that has to be removed. There's a lot of AR-15 forgings that are basically a solid block of metal with no machining done on them. And yeah, a good, good machinist could do that and turn that into a working gun, but it's a lot of material that has to be removed, it's a lot of work. Um, and uh, unless you want that particular challenge, I would look for the 80% frames. And like I said, they're so available and so inexpensive relative, relatively um, that uh, it doesn't seem like it's cost effective. Um, on the 1911, just again as given an example, on this 1911 80% frame, what would need to be done is the uh, slots for the slide have to be machined, um, and uh, there are no slots for the mainspring housing here, and so those have to be machined. Um, there's uh, uh, the holes for the grip uh, sides have to be threaded, um, and some other cleanup work here as far as clearance. Probably the most difficult thing that has to be done on this is that the hole for the disconnector, which is drilled at an angle, needs to be uh, done. And so that's, uh, the, you have to look at these, and these are much more variable because most of these are what I would call machining rejects when you find them. And so something won't be done on this, and you have to see it's with, if it's within your capabilities to do that. So what kind of tools do you need? Well, we talked about jigs and fixtures. If you're going to do the AR, you might get a jig like this that snaps on here. Uses the alignment holes that are on here so that you can drill the holes precisely. And then there are more parts of it that snap onto the top so that you can drill or mill the, for the fire control parts and that sort of thing. There's differences in the jigs that you buy. This particular one came from Brownells. Um, and uh, it's, uh, uh, I think it's a house brand that they, they use. But uh, at any rate, one of the things that it has, that, oh, it's tacticalmachining.com is where it came from. It, they have bushings that are put in here for uh, your drills. That's a lot better than the jigs that you find that are just blocks of aluminum with holes in them. And they're really, those are really only you know, one-time use jigs because you're likely to bugger up the holes if you're not careful. Um, so what do you use to drill them? You could drill with hand drill. You could drill with a drill press. You could drill with a mill drill. You could have a vertical mill. Um, Again, it's what you have, the best tool um, that you can get uh, is always gonna do the best job. So now let's get into a little bit more of the rules and regulations thing. So who, who can build a gun? Um, the, uh, the, if you go to the FAQ page from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and I think I might even have that address here. Um, they confirm that you can build a fire harm. Um, let's see if I have a quotation here. But uh, it's kind of like winemaking. You can build it for your own use, but you can't sell it. And the key phrasing, as I understand it, again, I'm not a lawyer, but the key phrasing is you can't build it for sale. So the interpretation, the conservative interpretation that I have of what I, everything I've read um, is that you can build it, you can use it as a firearm um, for whatever you want, and then 
you can pass it on to your heirs after you die, but you can't sell it. And some people think because it's, as long as you made it and used it for a period of time, you didn't make it for sale, then you can sell it. But I think that's slippery slope and dangerous. So if you wanted to do, make DIY guns, uh, then I would stick with uh, uh, figuring that it's, it's just going to be your, your project and not something that you can sell. Now, if it's a black powder weapon, there's different regulations related to that. So if you bought, say, a kit from Cabela's and made a, a muzzle loader, uh, there would be no problem with selling that. Oh, the, if you're taking notes, I had it on the screen, the, the BATF uh, FAQ page is www.atf.gov slash FAQ hyphen page number symbol T316 lowercase n 11091. And I have that af afterwards if anybody needs it. Um, but things are getting complicated. Uh, back in um, June of 2013, a gentleman in California who was told he could not buy a firearm, he got an 80% AR-15 receiver and successfully completed it into a working rifle. He also got a uh, 44 caliber black powder pistol and he went out and killed six people including himself uh, most of whom were relatives and it was a family beef and uh, after that that brought the 80 percent frame issue to legislatures in California and a uh, California representative named uh, Kevin DeLeon from Los Angeles is currently promoting a bill that would outlaw what he calls ghost guns. And they're called ghost guns because they don't have a serial number on that. Um, you could put a serial number on them and that's one of the things um, that I actually recommend people do if they're building their own firearms. I recommend putting a serial number, all of, all of the guns I've built have a serial number that is a coded date of when I finished the gun. And that gives me something for insurance purposes or for theft or whatever that I can, can identify that, that firearm. Now, other people want to have no identification at all. That's, that's your business. But there isn't a law that requires you, unless you are a class seven manufacturer, a licensed manufacturer to have a, a serial number on the gun. So that's, you know, that's an issue that, that you have to uh, work out. Um, the, uh, if you search for uh, Mr. DeLeon, um, you'll find some pretty entertaining YouTube videos from his uh, press conference where he announced the ghost gun legislation and almost everything he says in the press conference as a fact about firearms is wrong. He's got, you know, outrageous firing rates and it just is crazy. And it's interesting, just like in the case of Sandy Hook, none of the legislation that was passed after Sandy Hook addressed any of the issues that really were in the, the incident. Um, his legislation, the incident that it responded to, where the guy uh, shot six people, including himself, you know, there was no question of what weapon it was or tracing the weapon. They knew it was his, and they knew he built it. Um, but uh, because it has no serial number and it's not connected to a major manufacturer, there's no paper trail that they can follow. So they're saying that this could be really dangerous in investigating crimes where they don't have the weapon. So it's, you know, is what it is. Um, as I said, I, I put a serial number on all of my, my guns just to identify them and uh, keep track of them. So if you still want to do it, hearing all this kinds of stuff, so what, what tools do you need? 
I wish I could show you this picture. I have this great picture of this guy sitting on the floor of a uh, uh, workshop in Pakistan making AK-47s. And the only tools in this shop are files and some vices that are screwed down to wood stumps. And I'm sure that the guns that are made there, while we wouldn't necessarily call them really spectacular, wonderful precision weapons, I'm sure they work. And uh, so the tools, again, as I mentioned earlier, it depends on how sophisticated you want to go or what your experience is. If you know how to use machining tools and maybe you, you already own a mill and a lathe, uh, that's great. I operate with a manual uh, vertical mill and a manual old uh, ancient Logan lathe and uh, get just about everything done that I need to get done. Uh, other folks I know have CNC, you know, computer numerically controlled machines and do everything that they need with that. Um, you know, obviously common tools like files and stuff like that. As you get into things, there are a lot of specialty tools that have been made to make the life easier for gunsmiths. Like if you, uh, if you wanted to do a, a 1911 80% project, the big thing is getting the slide to fit properly and cutting the slide slots. Well, like you can buy um, a tool from Brunel's that uh, allows you to easily slide the slide back and forth and actually apply pressure and ram it so that you can uh, uh, get the, lap the sides there so that it's really precise and fits. And there's things, there's lots of specialty tools. It's like, you know, any hobby you get into, there's always gonna be gimmicks and things that you can get into and that may help your your project, or you may not want to do that. Um, sources of fly, I mentioned 80% frames. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them uh, from Sportsman's Guide, from Brownells. Um, there are some that show up, uh, well, there's lots the, of the AR ones that show up on Gun Broker, uh, the firearms auction site. Um, the firearms auction sites are really a good source for um, parts kits. So for example, there are a lot of uh, police agencies that uh, you know, they seize weapons, they destroy the receivers, and they, ha they, they license with or contract with somebody, a gunsmith or whatever, to take the parts. And there are guys that sell those kits from those seized weapons. So you could get all the parts you need to complete a particular gun, probably in an, an auction site. Um, I'll see if I can get some kind of a, a printout to do stuff. I had a bunch of, of references and resources here. There's, um, and this is nothing about, uh, it's, not, it's just a, a taste of what's out there. You start searching, you'll find all sorts of things. The first place that I got involved in doing this about 10 years ago was uh, a place called uh, uh, Rotterus. It's www.rotteruscustom.tzo.com. Rotterus is R-O-D-E-R-U-S. Um, and there's a forum there, and there's all sorts of stuff about uh, building various do-it-yourself firearms projects. Um, there is a forum called Weaponeer, www weaponeer.net. Um, that tends to be a lot of the military parts kit guys doing stuff. Um, I'm a little uncomfortable with some of that, but that may be what you're wanting to do. And that's, there, there's some very knowledgeable people there. Um, ar15.com, there's a lot of stuff on there to, to see. Um, for 1911s, m1911.org is a uh, uh, great place to get information, historical and otherwise. Um, catalogs and mail, mail order, I mentioned Brownells. Their website is www.brownells.com. They have a lot of videos about uh, gunsmithing and stuff there too. They're free. Uh, Midway USA is a good source of gunsmithing stuff. Dixie Gunworks, if you're into black powder, is a great source of kits and parts and that sort of thing. Track of the Wolf is sort of 
upscale black powder if you're into really high quality uh, uh, firearms. Uh, Grizzly Industrial, the you know, tool place. Uh, the, the owner, I know uh, Shiraz Bilio uh, personally, um, he is the captain of the uh, US F-Class rifle team uh, in addition to uh, running Grizzly Industrial and all the low cost tools and stuff that he sells. Um, he's a very uh, finicky guy and uh, he is now selling a lot of uh, uh, do-it-yourself firearms stuff. Uh, he has a great uh, DVD on uh, uh, barreling a rifle and that sort of thing for precision rifle shooting. Um, in auctions, I mentioned Gun Broker. Um, and of course, you know, my shameless plug, my blueprints. I have a list of more than 50 blueprints that I sell that are all different kinds of sources. Some of them are actual manufacturing drawings or ordnance blueprints that were used to make this stuff. Some of them are what I call gunsmith drawings where somebody just took a receiver and measured everything out and, and drew a drawing of it. Um, that doesn't have the tolerance information, that sort of thing. Um, others are CAD drawings, so it's, it's all over the map what they are because they don't all come from a you know, organized same source. But at the same time, they all provide some great information. And even if you're not going to build uh, a firearm, um, if you're like me and you're interested in some of the his history connected with this and the history of, of gun smiths and gun building, like one of the things that you start seeing is how these guys think when they're building a gun. One of the things, for example, today we talked about a vertical mill. That's a tool that cuts with a rotary action. John Browning did not have a milling machine in his shop in the 1800s when he started. Um, and he, but he did have a shaper, which is, we now consider an antiquated machine. It's a machine tool that has a back and forth motion and has a fixed cutting tool that cuts. Well, and that explains why a lot of John Browning's designs were slots because that cuts slots really well. And Colt, even to this day, uses shapers in the manufacture of 1911s in their factory in Hartford. So there's all sorts of things that go there. The other thing that I would add uh, is don't attempt anything that you aren't comfortable doing. Do research, get advice, and test, test, test. Um, even uh, Cody Wilson and his plastic gun, his first test was, you know, on a stand with a string and at a distance. There's a great old video that you can get from Colonial Williamsburg about making flintlock rifles from scratch. And the guy t tests his barrels by putting four times the load in them, getting a hundred yards away and pulling a string <laughs> to test them, uh, test fire. And, uh, you know, that's a guy who's building very expensive, very beautiful weapons and has been doing it for years and years. So test everything, be safe. Um, and, uh, you know, my standard disclaimer that's on all my blueprints is that I can't assume any responsibility for the accuracy of the information. You, that's really up to you. I mean, we're Liberty folks here. We understand personal responsibility. Um, and what you do with it you, you have to take that responsibility to be legal um, and be advised that a lot of the laws are different from state to state. I mentioned that, you know, I can't necessarily buy a receiver in Connecticut, um, but somebody in New Hampshire can. So you need to know what the situation is in, in your locale and that may be very different. I'd love to answer any questions if I can, um, and uh, I'm at uh, space 39 if somebody wants to stop by and see what blueprints we have. And uh, that's pretty much what I got for today. Any questions out there? Yes, sir. That's questionable. Who knows? They won't ship it to you, yeah. Right. Well, my reading of the law is you should be able to own the 80%. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to own the paperweight. But beyond that, we don't know. And then I also, I, I should add, um, 
that a friend of mine paid a gun specialist lawyer a couple of thousand dollars for uh, a legal opinion related to this um, before Sandy Hook. Um, and he, the lawyer, went to the state police in Connecticut and they were unaware of a lot of this stuff going on, um, or said they were. And they were very uncomfortable with it. And they said, even if it's legal from a federal standpoint, they'd be very tempted to charge any home gunsmith with reckless endangerment if they felt they needed to charge him with something. So, you know, I, we all know that the, the government will charge, you know, anybody with something if they can do it, they can find it. So that's, that's something that you need to know too. Um, but, uh, any, rate, any other questions? Well, like I said, thanks for coming everybody and you're welcome to stop by and, and talk. Sorry the presentation didn't work. Thank you.